downtown today, which is our historical uh, museum here in Wichita. It's about uh, Wichita back in the 1850s and 1860s, or just 1860s? 1870s. 1870s, I'm so sorry. <laughs> and this here is Anthony. He is the education director for Cowtown, and as you can see, he also does historical reenactments. And I'm going to go ahead and let Anthony tell you a little bit about what he does here and why Cowtown is such a cool place. Okay. Well, the first question people often ask is, what are museums for? Why do we have museums? Well, first of all, everybody likes to collect stuff. If you're a kid, you probably have a collection of rocks or bottle caps or things like that. And adults do the same exact thing only we like to collect bigger things. Now, we are an organization in which we collect things that are very, very old. Now, the art museum is also a museum, but they collect paintings and things like that. So there's lots of different kinds of museums. Now, what we do is we collect things so that we can preserve them, and then we also want to display them, and we want to use them to tell a story or tell the story of the, of the artifact itself. So whenever you break down the word history, the word story is in the middle. And so we want to be able to tell you the story of what happened a long, 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 long time ago. See, the thing about learning about history and history books is we kind of assume that everything happened because that was just the way it was going to happen. But actually, history is made up of lots of different choices. And we are the result of people making choices. Had other, other people made different choices, we might be in a different place, in a different town, or a different time. It's hard to tell. So, anyways, but I thought I would first start, talk a little bit and show you some of the things that we use. We're going to go inside to the general store. <laughs> different purposes if we can't find the correct artifact or if the artifact is too precious that we don't want other people to look at it or if we just don't have one. Now, whenever we deal with artifacts, we have to make sure that we wear gloves and keep ourselves as clean as possible. Um, our hands have bacteria and viruses on and it, they can get on to the metal pieces of what I'm going to show you. Uh, so this is a cooking stove, a toy cooking stove. And this is something that was from the 1870s, and it is a artifact. Uh, this is something that kids would have played with a long, long, long time ago. But I'm an education person, and so I want kids to try things out and play with things. I can't let you play with this stuff here. But uh, we are able to purchase this stove here, which is a reproduction, which means it's almost a copy of what we have right here. And so I can leave this out on the counter and let kids like yourself open the door and look inside and see what's going on and, and just have a little bit of fun with learning what it is. This thing here though, I have to put back under glass because we want to make sure that we preserve it. And that's the big thing. To keep things to last a long, long, long time ago, you gotta keep, your, keep things nice and clean. We don't want the germs and the viruses to get on there. But we also have to keep the temperature about the same place and, we, and artifacts don't like things that are wet, and so what we call humidity, they have to keep the humidity in the air low, so it's really kind of dry. So, so Kansas um, is the perfect place. <laughs> <laughs> 
Um, I once was at a conference where they had a handsaw where someone was using to cut wood, and about 50 years before, whenever it had been donated, somebody with greasy hands had grabbed hold of that saw, and nobody had touched it for 50 years, at least that, that part of it. And whenever they pulled it out of their collection, you could actually see the fingerprints on the saw. And they actually did a, one of those powder tests, and you could act, they actually got fingerprints from it. Wow, they got it off. that's so cool. So your fingers have oils on it that, that germs and virus and bugs like, and they're going to eat away at the metal. So that's why we want to do that. So, okay? So how come it, they use cast iron? Is it just to make it more durable because back then kids only had a couple toys and it had to last for brothers and sisters? Very good question. In our era, plastic has not been invented. Metal and paper were basically what a lot of your to toys were like. Um, this is cast iron. A lot of toys were also made out of tin. Oh, also a lot of new paper. Paper dolls were all the rage. You could buy a kit that you could make a paper house with, and then you could put different clothing on your paper dolls, and you could go inside and have tea on your paper doll furniture, and it's just really kind of fun. But there are all sorts, I don't know that we've got any tin toys in here right now. No, I don't see anything. Anyways, but that's, a lot, that's those are three things we're kind of what a lot of our toys are made out of. So. Obviously, none of us are living. There's not anybody left that's from that generation. So, how do, what do you guys know? How do you know what you need to do to reenact history? Well, we are very fortunate, especially in this day and age, that we have things, something called the internet, and we can do a lot of different research about what was going on. In our era, there was lots and lots and lots of printed material that we can use to help decide what life is like. Now, one of the most common ones is the newspaper. Now, this is the Wichita Eagle newspaper whenever it was first made in 1872, and it has all sorts of stories about daily life and political things that are happening. But my favorite part of the newspaper is this column right here, called the Town and Country News. And if you went to visit someone, it might say Mrs. Mr. and Mrs. Smith and their family are visiting relatives in Topeka. Or Mr. Jones brought the first tomato of the season. Or the wheat is looking extremely good. Or the weather is very pleasant and we hope that it will continue. So this kind of gives us ideas about everyday living that people did back in our time period, and because it's on the internet and we have printers, we can make copies of these things. So, uh, other things that we use, uh, fashion magazines. This is uh, Godey's Ladies Book. It started before the Civil War. And the thing that I like, it has all sorts of interesting stories and fashion pictures in it, inside of it. Um, there's kind of a trifold of of different fashion things that ladies might have been looking to wear. And we're very, very fortunate because it also has some colored drawings. Now, can you believe it? Somebody actually used um, ink or watercolors and they painted all the colors on these individually, which is very, very hard to believe. But we can get an idea of what people were wearing back in our time. Uh, also, in our time, they are just starting to make pa paper patterns for clothing. And so here we have different styles of dresses and bodices and underwear and all sorts of different clothing that people had the option of buying and making at home. And so that, those are two good resources that tell us what kind of things people were wearing back in our time period. Also, I don't know whether or not you write a diary or not, but we use a lot of diaries for people to help us figure out what happened from day to day to day. Most people are interested in who won a war or who won a battle, but really what people want to know is what these people have for breakfast. 
And how what time did they go to sleep? And did they get a hundred on their spelling test? And so if we read diaries, we can get that kind of information. So that kind of helps us fill out. Now there are a couple of other things that I wanted to show you. Um, this is Montgomery Ward catalog, and it used to be a, a department store where you could mail things, uh, mail orders and get things. So if you wanted, it doesn't have too many pictures, but if you wanted to know what kind of traveling trunks you would use to go to some place, why there they've got a number of things that you can purchase. Um, but there are all sorts of catalogs. This is a uh, Remington's uh, gun catalog. So if you want to know what kind of guns people were using back in our era and how much they cost, which is an important thing, you could use that sort of thing. And if you wanted to know what kind of furniture people had inside their houses, and this is one of the things that we use to help us whenever somebody donates something and they say, well, my great, 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 great grandma had this. And we look at it and we say, well, not sure if it actually fits the style of the time. But if we look at a catalog like that, we can tell, oh yeah, they did have a table like that. Uh, let's see. Another furniture book. Oh, and I completely forgot. Well, here we go. So here are some pictures of some bedroom furniture. So we can see on this particular page here that they have a, a bed, a dresser, but they also had a rocking chair inside of, inside of their bedroom. So all of these things help us figure out what people were doing and using back in our time. Now I keep talking about time or time period. Our museum dis decided that we are going to cover 1865 through 1880. Now, if you come and want to donate something to us that's from 1890, we'll probably find another museum that would be interested in something like that. But if you want to donate something to us from 1860, we'll probably accept that because we know that by 1880, it was probably still around and still being used and that kind of thing. So, Now, um, I also wanted to, this is another, exciting thing that we found just a little bit ago. This is a picture book for kids, kindergarten, first, second, third. I actually like to look at it as well. But it gives all sorts of tools that different trades would have used. This is a train station. Here we have mom out in the garden, different plants that she would have used. Here we have another picture of the inside of some of, some of the houses. So it's very, 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 very helpful in helping us to reconstruct what happened a long, long, long time ago. And like I say, that is what people are interested in. They want to know what the everyday person tried to do. The other thing that we are very, very fortunate to have in our era, photography has been invented and it's becoming really, really, really popular. So, I've blown up a couple of pictures. These are actually quite a bit smaller. So here I have a picture of a mom and a child. Most people, whenever I show this to they say, that must be a girl because she has a dress on. Actually, both boys and girls wore dressing gowns until they were done wearing diapers and they were done crawling around. So, now, if we go ahead, here we have a picture of a little girl. She's about four years old. And look at her stockings. She's got striped stockings. For a long time, we assumed that girls only wore white stockings, but that's not the one we found out to be true. Now here's just a man on the street, and I kind of like it because it seems funny because he has the top button buttoned of his coat, and, the and it's wide open, but the other thing is he has a hat that's similar to what I'm wearing. And then here we have a, a man and a woman on their wedding day. And in our era, white dresses have not become all the rage for weddings. Basically, a lady would make a nice dress, and then she would use that nice dress for every day, or for going to church and fancy parties and things like that until it started to wear out a little bit, and then she would take some of the ribbon off, and then it would become an everyday dress. And so then we would make a nice dress for church and things. So, so things were a little bit more challenging. But my favorite picture is this picture here. This is a family picture. The thing I like to show people is the differences in what people were wearing. 
a lot of in our time girls always wore dresses they never got to wear pants and a lot of girls whenever i tell them that they say oh that's boring actually this lady has a different dress than that lady who has a different dress than that lady than that lady and this little girl and so ladies have all sorts of different types of clothing that they could wear even though they were all dresses now men's clothing on their other hand men men's clothing are kind of boring we kind of stay a lot the same so, so a lot ladies have a lot of different choices so what we do is we take all of this information the information from the newspapers the information from the diaries the information from our catalogs and the information from our pictures and we think about it and think about it and we write it all down and then we create characters or we create looks that we know people were doing back in our era so that they get a good idea of what so whenever people come to visit us they get a good idea of what people were looking like and how they were acting in our time period okay.
In the 1870s, this is your school room, okay? Your teacher had a very, very difficult job because your teacher, she had to teach all the different grades, all the different subjects. Te classrooms in our time were very noisy because you might have these folks here learning the state capital or states. You might have them learning the state and the state capitals. You might have these guys memorizing the, the countries of the world and maybe the rivers and its tributaries of the world. And over there, they might be talking about the presidents of the United States and who they were. And it would be very, very noisy. And yet somehow people, people were still able to be learning. Now, a couple of important things. Um, your class most likely is in a building that has air conditioning and heat. In our time, if it got hot, we opened up the windows. If it, we got cold, there's a stove in the back of the room. But where does the stuff to, to burn inside of it come from? Every morning, the boys, well, let me back up. In the evenings, the boys would bring in a lot of firewood and coal so that your teacher Whenever she got here, about a half hour before you guys got here, she would start a fire in the stove and start to get the building warm. And throughout the day, uh, the boys, unfortunately, were the ones that got to put more wood into the fire. In our area, there were jobs that were boy jobs, and there were jobs that were girl jobs. And so they did often mix their coffins. The other thing is that while you're in school, sometimes kids get thirsty. We don't have any plumbing inside the building. We don't have a water fountain, but we would have a bucket in the back with a little dipper inside of it. Now, if you if your mom and dad had enough money, they could send you with your own cup and you could pour water into your cup and drink it. If your mom and dad didn't have a whole lot of money, you would just go and drink out of the dipper. And that's, some people think that's kind of gross, but that was one of the things that we did. So, you're in school, you need to go to the bathroom. Oh, the bathroom is a little building way out there. And in the this, in this fall and the spring, it's not too bad, but in the cold of winter, it's not very nice because it's not a heated building. So. And then um, you do your lessons, you do your lessons. It's lunchtime. Well, this is your cafeteria. Everybody brought their own lunches. Nobody got school lunches because we don't do that yet. And so you'd go to the club room and get your lunch and you would eat at your desk. And then if it's recess time, you guys would get to run around and, and go out and play. And come back in, do your lessons, and at the end of the day, you would pack up all of your books and your slate board, and whenever the teacher was ready to dismiss you, uh, everybody would stand up beside their desk. You, of course, would let the girls go first because ladies before gentlemen, and once the girls are all gone, then the boys would leave, and then, then the school day would be over. Unless you're one of the boys that have to bring more coal and wood for the teacher in the morning. So, so that's pretty much a pretty much a school day. Starting about the same well, eight thirty is about when they start, and then usually every. So let's kind of a bird's eye view of school. Let's see, is there anything else that, that I should mention? Ah, we, we don't have, um, some of your classrooms may have a whiteboard that you have a projector with a computer on. Uh, if we have you do work on this, on, our whiteboard is actually a blackboard. And it's basically, basically just a giant chalkboard. So that's what it would be. Teacher would write their instructions and things like that. So. Yes? Okay, so you mentioned that they go first grade through sixth grade. Mm -hmm. You did not mention kindergarten. They don't have, how, how when, when do the kids typically go to school? About six or seven? Um, kindergarten is kind of a radical new idea. Um, it was felt that children were, would be best at home learning from mom and dad, basically moms learning from the moms how they should behave and how they should act. And, and whenever the kindergarten idea was invented, it was very, very, very radical. Uh, very, um, a lot of people were very concerned about it. Number one, because you're taking children who are so young away from their first teacher, which is their mom, and giving them to another person who may or may not be a, a lady. A lot of 
teachers in our time period were men as well as women. So that was a challenge. Well, and then the opposite end, he said sixth grade. Mm -hmm. So in a prairie town, what happens if they want to go to secondary school? Um, Wichita does, does not. Wichita graduates its first high school class in 1877, which means for seven years that the town was in, built and working, there was no high school. And so you would get to a certain grade, and if you wanted to go further, then your mom and dad would send you to a boarding school, maybe in Kansas City. Uh, Emporia had a nice boarding school as well, and then you could get more education there. But most people kind of figure that by sixth grade, you knew basically what you needed to know. You knew how to add, subtract, and multiply, and divide. You could write a nice letter. You could read to your, to your children and your brothers and sisters. And what else do you know? Oh, you knew the history about the country. So what else do you need? Now today, we look at education more as a tool to help you continue to learn and grow. In our era, Education was looked at as something that you got, something that you achieved, and once you've achieved it, you're pretty well done and it's time to go on with the rest of your life and apply what you've learned. Whereas we do a lot more about growing and learning and thinking, so a little bit different. <laughs> so, you following that line, college was not a thing that you wanted to do. Right. No. Especially in the, the, the Midwest and the West. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So, very few people even achieved that or even thought of doing that because it was so expensive? Was it really cost prohibitive for like a farmer's child to go to college? Um, the bias in our time period is most people thought that you should work. You should do some kind of work, productive work. And the idea of working in your head, which is where a lot of college happens, people are kind of like, yeah, what are you producing? What are you making? You're not really making anything whenever you're going to college. You know, what more can you learn that we haven't taught you already? So, so yeah, it did cost a lot. And if you were rich and wealthy, you could probably go there. That would be a good thing. If you were a little bit poor, that was probably not even something you'd even think about why you would even want to go, let alone have the money to go. So after sixth grade, say, they so, would then go on to like, work the farm or work mm -hmm. an apprenticeship or something like that? And all throughout first grade through sixth grade, um, kids also did all sorts of jobs around home. And so um, on the farm, if it's time to plant the crops and dad needs you, eh, you can skip school today. I'll need you out on the farm. And the same thing in town. If your mom is carrying a lot of produce, putting it up from the garden, mom would say, kids, you guys stay and help me today. So school was important, it was very important, but at the same time, the work that you had to do was also very, very important. So, so yeah, it's, it's kind, of, kind of funny. One of the most popular things as far as recreation work, um, we would have uh, literary societies that would have um, spelling contests and plays that the kids would put on and dramatic readings that the kids would put on. So school was not only teaching the kids, it was also a way to show off and entertain the rest of the town as well. So there's a lot going on. <laughs> so. One of the jobs of the museum, our museum, is that because we are a small town, we are able to show lots of different parts of life. And the thing that I find most important is we are able to show different levels of life. Now, this is a small three-room house, and it would have been a lower-class house. It uh, wouldn't necessarily be next door to the upper-class folks, but the museum's kind of small, so we have to compact things. But this gives us a chance to show the different styles of living. Now, this room here is, is kind of their reception room, their sitting room, but it's also their living room. So this is their family space. Whereas the house that we'll visit next has a room that is just for visiting. And they're able to do that because they have a lot more money than, than the other folks in town. Uh, the next room is, the, is their kitchen. 
and most likely they we don't have one right now because we have walking through but there would have been a table here this is where you would have eaten and then in the bedroom we have the bedroom set up for two four six probably six to eight people in one in one bedroom so it's kind of crowded and cramped but by having this house here we can show this style of living so that whenever we move next door to the house next door, we can show you how the living has progressed and basically what money would buy you. <laughs> and you guys did hear that right. He said three room, not three bedroom, what we're normally here. And he did say that six to eight people could sleep in one room. So that means like if you were sleeping in the same room with your mom and your dad and your brothers and your sisters and everybody, and if somebody came to visit, your cousins would sleep in there too. <laughs> Very true, very true. So we, the way we have this, this house set up, um, mom and dad and youngest child, and then three to four kids in the other bed. So that's kind of how we get that number, so. Anyways, let's, we're gonna step next door and move, uh, move up in the income. <clears throat> level a little bit and we'll show you that house. We now entered the Murdoch house. It was the home of Marshall and Victoria Murdoch. He was the man that published the Wichita Eagle newspaper and he was a little bit wealthier than, than some of the other folks in town. Not the wealthiest, but he did have a little bit more money. And I wanted to stop in here just for a moment because if you were a visitor, you would have come in through the front door and this door would have been closed because we don't let you go into the other part of the house. We would have you step inside this room here. This is called our front parlor and that is a place where people would visit with each other. Now, in our era, one of the most important things was to show everybody some very, 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 very nice things. Now, for kids, this is a room that you don't like very much at all because until the age of 12, if mom and dad let you come in, you got to sit on that little red couch with your feet on the floor and your hands in your laps and your back up straight. No wiggling, no giggling, and no talking because children are to be seen and not heard from. You are representing what a good job mom and dad are doing of raising such well-behaved kids. Now, after the age of 12, if you are invited into the parlor, you are expected to talk with the other adults in the same manner that the other adults are. So the years that you have sp spent watching and learning, you would know not to talk about politics and not to talk about religion and not to talk about bodily health unless, oh, he's doing poorly or something like that. But you would know how to converse with people, okay? Now, whenever our visit would be done, our guests would get up and they would go back out the front door and they would never get to see the rest of the part of the house. The rest of the part of the house could be very, very plain and unadorned because we put all of our money into making this room look so nice as we could, so. But we're gonna let you come into the next room. Oh, I should also mention, um, now the parlor is a very special room. It is only used for visiting. Now on Sunday afternoons, we might let the kids come in and, and relax and read a book or something like that. But there are some times that we would specially use the parlor for kids. If you had a birthday, we often would let you come inside. But the most important was Christmas. On Christmas Eve, mom and dad would set up the Christmas tree underneath this little light here in the middle. Um, this family was probably old enough to have a tree. This family was probably wealthy enough to have a full-size tree from the floor up to this, to about this tall. Most families in town that only had a tabletop tree that went on top, but they would decorate the tree in the center of the room. And on Christmas morning, before you guys got to come inside and look at the tree, we didn't have electric lights, but we did have candles. So mom and dad would go around and light all the candles that were on the tree. They would open up the door and let the kids come up 
in and we watch the tree with the flickering flames for probably three or four minutes and then we blow out all the candles because we don't want the tree to go on fire and then we would have the rest of our christmas celebration now for kids like you christmas was kind of special because we used to decorate our tree with your presents we also decorate a lot of our ornaments with <laughs> edible so we used to put cookies on the tree so you could nibble on a cookie some people decorated with popcorn so you can chew on that popcorn it may be a little stale but you could still chew on it we also would dip fruit in sugar and hang it on the tree and so you had frosted fruit that you could eat so yeah that always added to the specialness of it so but once christmas morning was over maybe you get to stay in the parlor through the rest of christmas day but after Christmas Day was over, pretty much goes back to normal. So I know some folks put up their Christmas tree before, before Thanksgiving and keep it up until after New Year's. Eh, not so much in, in our area, so, okay? And there were all these real trees, because remember Mr. Anthony said, there was no plastic. Mm -hmm. So they literally had to go out and cut their own tree and put it up. Although by our time, the railroad is here, and so they actually would ship in a lot of Christmas trees, which oh, seems so a little, cool. little bit strange. So, And the funny thing is that in this era, um, the Germans who introduced the Christmas tree tradition, because of deforestation that's going on in Germany, they're actually starting to create some of the first artificial trees. And instead of um, using plastic, they use feathers, goose feathers, that they put on the tree. Okay, that seems a lot more fun. <laughs> <laughs> well, they got a lot smaller. So. Anyways, um, so this is this is the dining room. This is where you would get to eat all of your meals. Uh, for kids, it is a place for yes, ma'am, no, sir, please, and thank you three times a day because you are training, you are learning how to be a good and proper citizen with good manners. If you decide not to follow the manners that mom and dad expect of you, you'll find yourself sitting in the kitchen eating with the cook, which is very embarrassing. And so you want to make sure that you follow the rules as well as you can. The other thing you may notice, the room is very dark. Uh, we always had a white tablecloth so that whenever your mom put her food on the table, it would show off really, really nicely. And that was one of the things that was very important. So. Now in the far corner is a door that goes up to the second floor. This family had three bedrooms upstairs. One for mom and dad and the babies, one for the boys, and one for the girls. So the kids are still sharing bedrooms, but they're not having to share bedrooms with everybody. So, and this family is pretty typical of our time period. Um, over the life of the family, they had eight kids. Unfortunately, four of them died before they got to the age of five, and out of the remaining, we had um, one, one lady who dies right after childbirth. So we only have three kids that grow up to be adults. But that wasn't terribly unusual because medicine didn't work as well as it does today. Now the next room is the back parlor, or what we would call the living room. There's lots of toys and games, so it's obvious that kids got to be in here. And so this is where you would spend your time relaxing and the like. Uh, you will notice that in the far corner we do have a sewing machine. Um, Mrs. Murdoch, even though she was wealthier, she still could either create some of her clothing or she could hire a seamstress to come and use her sewing machine to sew the clothing for her. So, but the clothing still falls on the ladies to take care of them. And sewing machines were definitely for the wealthy, correct? Well, yes and no. Um, Mr. Singer is one of the first people that has decided to sell you something on time. For $5 a month, you can have a sewing machine in your house. And so it made, made it very easy for, for rich people and poor people to have sewing machines in their houses. So for girls, 
We now have dress patterns that you can buy for 25 cents or so. And we now have sewing machines that you can buy. And fabric is getting a little bit cheaper because of the railroad and the steam power. And so your fashions are just getting more and more. Your choices are getting more and more possible. But you still need to take care of your stuff though. <laughs> well, and then so in the early, like 1860s, mm -hmm. Most of it was hand sewn, correct? Right. Mm -hmm. um, and then, so as people got wealthier, uh -huh. more, uh -huh. uh, what's the word I'm looking for? As life got more modern, right. then things became easier for uh -huh. people. But you still made your own clothes. Yeah. And even whenever the sewing machine came in, um, Ladies' clothing has lots of fringes and ruffles and mm -hmm. gigaws in it, and so, yeah, ladies, the yeah, sewing machine cut down on the amount of time, but you still had to do a lot of finish work. Unless you were making an everyday dress, then that would, you could probably do most of it just by, just by the sewing machine, so. Yeah. I see the doors broken. What's that? <laughs> I see the doors broken. Yeah, right. <laughs> So this is the kitchen. This is where we would do all of the cook work, cooking for the family. It also has the furnace for the house. The stove in here would have kept most of the house warm, as well as the stove in the in the sitting room or the the, the back parlor. Um, but um, the Murdochs were wealthy enough that they were able to hire a young lady to help them do the prep work peeling potatoes and chopping the onions and stuff like that. But Mrs. Murdoch, because her reputation goes on the food that goes to the table, she would be involved in actually cooking a lot of this stuff just to make sure that things reflected her seasonings and her taste and so on. So. Um, so we've got our kitchen cupboards. <clears throat> we have our counters, which is our workspace. We have our stove. Um, to one thing we don't have is a kitchen sink. We're in the process of requiring one, but it would have been similar similar to the wash stand, only about twice as big and a little bit taller. But the one thing we also have is we do have a refrigerator. So you may have heard of a refrigerator referred to as an ice box. Well, the ice box, a piece of ice goes on the top. And as it melts, it keeps your food down below cool, and it makes it last a lot longer. Now, for kids, there were some important jobs that you had to do. Number one, you need to make sure that we have plenty of wood or coal to heat up our stove to cook our food and keep our house warm. If we need water, you guys are going to have to go out and get our water for us and bring it back. And you also have to take the dirty water back out because we don't have dirt plumbing in our house. And on the bottom of the, um, the ice box, there's a little tray. All of that melted ice has to go somewhere, so it ends up in a tray in the bottom. And so kids had to take that and toss that outside. So, so there were a lot of important chores that kids had to do, no matter what level of, of money your mom and dad's had. So. And girls were typically in the kitchen with mom, learning girls, alongside. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And the boys were usually with Pa at wherever yeah. he worked. Mm -hmm. Which creates a bit of a challenge whenever Dad starts working in town. So we find more and more jobs for, for boys to do. <laughs> yeah. uh, one of the unique things about our museum is that we are called an open-air museum. All of the different buildings that you see around us are exhibits. Now, there are museums that are basically one big building that have different portions of it, and they do a great job as well. The challenge for us, though, is that we have individual spaces. Sometimes people forget that, that they're actually in a museum, and so that creates a bit of a challenge. But the nice thing is that you can feel like you're in an old town from a long, long time ago, and, and you can see how people did things. So. So that's, that's one of the more unique things that we have going for us. So, any of the kids watching this, um, say they want, they think this is really amazing. What would, say, the kids who are in junior high, high school level, 
they're really interested in history, what would you ex recommend to them to do to start learning about it? Um, yeah, uh, one of the great things to start doing is, is starting to read as much history as you can. Uh, you guys now have the access with the internet. You can find all sorts of resources, some of the picture books that I was showing you. You can also find videos of people doing things that we would have been doing a long time ago. Um, I just ran across, yesterday, I just ran across a whole series of videos from Fort Scott where they show the people doing laundry and cooking on the stove and they showed the military men doing their marches and their drilling and firing a cannon and so there's lots of cool stuff that you can learn just by watching that. <laughs> but stu studying and reading is, is a great thing. Um, if you find that, that history and this type of thing is really, really interesting, talk to your mom and dad. We do allow volunteers as young as babies to come out and help us talk about history. You just have to bring your mom and dad until you get to be 16. After 16, you can come out on your own and, and we can work with you. But it's a fun way to talk to people and just talk about the history and things that you're most interested in. And it's a very, very fun way to get started. So, so we, we rely on a lot of volunteers. Um, I have a staff of six people and we have about 200 volunteers all told that we can draw on when we need to. So it's a very, very important part of, of who we are as a museum. If you decide to come out and volunteer, we will give you a whole lot of stuff to read. And a lot of people learn that way. Uh, we will also pair you with someone that has actually been doing some reenacting for a while so that you can kind of learn the types of things that they do. And you can figure out how to talk to people. Um, in a museum world, we want to be educating of people, but at the same time, we also want to entertain them. Nobody likes a lecture, but we want to have conversations with people about the history. So how would you do this? Why would you do that? This is how we did it. How do you do it today? And so all sorts of different ways to, to visit with people. So um, training is basically ongoing, but in reality, you, you learn a whole lot more by starting out and doing it. Um, Whenever we have people come out and staff our buildings, one of the first thing that people say is, do I get a script? We don't do scripts because we want you to talk to people, find out what they're interested in, and give them information that is individualized to them. If I give you a script, if, any, if anybody interrupts you halfway through, it's kind of like saying your ABCs. Most people go A, B, C, D, 3, E, F, G, and if you interrupt someone halfway through, in their head, they're gonna go A, B, C, D, so you have to go back to the start and, and restart. So if you have a script and you're relying on a script, you're not listening to the people, you're not interacting with the people, you're not finding out what they're interested in. It's a nice crutch, but it can be a crutch too long, and so you don't wanna, don't wanna do it. So. So we will give you tips and ideas and ways and we will model for you. And to a degree, modeling becomes a bit of a script, but it's not something that you memorize, it's something that you do and it, it makes things a lot more, a lot more different. Now, um, I did mention, um, we do have a, I, I didn't mention, we do have a number of craft sites on the grounds. Um, we have a carpenter shop and a printing shop and our blacksmith and also our farm. And so those are places where you can do activities. Uh, we also have our ladies dress shop where if you'd like to learn how to do some sewing, we can teach you how to do that. Um, in our residences, uh, we do some, some uh, cooking on the wood stove as well as other things. Uh, we will do laundry periodically out, outdoors. And so we try to do things that people would find interesting, but also would showcase what everyday life would, would be like. So unfortunately with the virus, we've had to curtail a lot of that. And so hopefully whenever all this is over, we'll go back to being what we normally are. Which is an amazing museum. As and then so to become you, to do what you do as the education director and working in a, a historical museum, especially one that does reenactments, what kind of training, education, whatnot would you need to become you? Okay, well, very good, very good, very good. 
Um, my path was just a little bit different. I went to college very, very, very much late in life. I think I was 33 whenever I went to college. And I went to school to become a teacher. And during the summer months, I needed something to do. And I started volunteering here because I thought education would go along with the history portion. And as I worked with the people here, they said, hmm, would you like to come work with us? And so I worked out here for a summer. And then they said, would you like to be our educator? And so, yes, by then I had graduated. So I had my elementary education degree. And so I could write programs and teach kids. And that was kind of how I got into it. Um, I still go to a lot of conferences and a lot of meetings with other museum educators so that I can keep learning and keep growing. Um, with all the changes that have happened with social media and, and uh, the internet and the computer things that the kids are able to do today, really need to work at keeping up with, with what's going on. So. Uh, I have thought about going back to school for a master's degree. Uh, Wichita State has a public history degree which focuses on museum studies, and so that would be my next step uh, that would help me a lot if I have time. <laughs> so, anyways, um, I love this job. It is great. Number one, on a daily basis, I get to see and talk to people from all over the world and I get to talk to people and show them history which I love the everyday parts of history how people did things and the part that I enjoy the most is probably talking to kids and teaching kids because you guys are so creative and you're so interested in what's going on the important thing about, about our museum is that we can show you what people did a long long time ago because you guys are going to face some of the same problems and so you might want to think about how people a long time ago did things it can help you learn a little more, give you another perspective on things. As I mentioned earlier, I, me personally, Miss Gretchen, has been coming here, I would say since the 80s, yes I'm that old. <laughs> um, I've grown up around Cowtown and it's one of my favorite places, my kids have grown up here. Um, during normal times, you guys got to come out and visit us, especially if you guys were transplants from all over the world because, you know, Air Force Base is awesome. We see people from everywhere. This is a really cool, just a piece of our history here in your current town. And they have things like Fashion Christmas. They do an old-fashioned county fair. During normal times, they have an old-fashioned baseball team that actually travels right and other museums have their team that comes and plays which is really fun to watch they do roaring 20s <laughs> which is not part of the normal history um, they also have things like um, the saloon has dances uh -huh. and and then we also have our, our entrepreneur group which does the social dances the, the ball gowns and the, the tails and things like that so uh, if you on some of the special event weekends you can come here and you can see the different classes of people and then you can go downtown and see how different classes of people would have entertained themselves and so yeah it, it, it's a lot of it's a lot of fun a lot of to me. there's usually something fun to do here and it's really it is a really cool little gem that we have here so definitely come out and visit them this is a really cool place i don't know how with covid we all know that life is a little crazy, but it will get back to normal eventually, or some kind of normal. But this is definitely one of your go-to spots. You guys should definitely come as a family before you move on to your new base. Special thanks to Mr. Anthony and the people at Old Cowtown Museum. For more information, visit their website at www.oldcowtown.org. You can find a wealth of information from their website such as days and hours of operation, 
as well as this really awesome map of the Cowtown grounds. If you take a look at the map, it shows the layout of the entire Cowtown grounds and each building and what they are. The Cowtown Experience drop-down menu has a whole bunch of subsections to look at, such as the 1880 DeVore Farm. If you click on each one of these, either before you go to the museum or after returning, it can tell you a little bit more about each of the buildings you've encountered. Don't forget to check out the calendar tab for upcoming events and daily activities. Go and show old Cowtown your support. Thanks for watching. See you next time.